sorry for crashing the party. It feels like we're crashing the party now. Um, because we now have to discuss whether NFTs are dead or not. So it feels like yesterday was all about the art and I was I was running around like a little kid yesterday evening. Yeah, we didn't hear about floor prices and and I don't know, um, all the money talk and now I'm the person like crashing the party. Um, I forgot about that obviously yesterday. So yeah, thank you Saifa, it says Vasily and um, Ivona for being here with us. We have two founders, an artist and you're basically everything. <laughs> which is great. Um, so yeah, maybe let's start with the two founders. Um, Seth, you started during the pandemic. Um, you came from the physical world and um, yeah, you set up Bright Moments. So how did you experience the past? Has it been three years by now? I think so. <coughs> three Wild. years. You need to have a party to crash it. So... Um, you want the background of bright moments last three years or me? Yeah, I think that would be nice if you could good give your um, background. I mean, I've, saw, I've seen the movie, which is really impressive. Okay. So if you have the chance, watch the documentary about bright moments. It's very touching. So maybe a few words about bright moments and then how you've experienced the past three years when it comes to working with artists and a bit about the market, because I think that's what we have to speak about. Okay. And we're gonna, we have some books outside. I'll hand out the bright moments books uh, that kind of document the journey afterwards. Um, so we started Bright Moments, um, importantly, after the pandemic um, in Los Angeles and Venice Beach in June of 2021. We had our first show, which was with Jeff Davis, who was just in this chair. And, um, uh, you know, my background was, I was in 1993 at ZKM working with Jeff Shaw and William Forsyth, and I was the archivist for Robert Wilson, and somehow full circle after many years of being a founder and entrepreneur, I found myself very disillusioned by startups and sort of late stage Silicon Valley capitalism, and I wanted to start an NFT gallery because it seemed like a good thing to do coming out of the pandemic to bring people together and to have an opportunity to show digital art on screens and the big unlock was um, NFTs. Um, you didn't have to ship or insure them in crates. I could just put them on the screen. And so we bought three screens um, and we hung them from the rafters and we started showing NFTs. And our first show was Jeff. Um, it was a project called Portals. And, uh, and that began the journey. And as part of it, we started giving away uh, NFTs for free um, to bring people to the gallery. They were called Crypto Venetians. And, um, make a, a very long, interesting story short, um, we proceeded to give away, um, to mint 10,000 of these crypto citizens over the last, over three years. We were in Berlin um, in um, April of 2022 at Kraftwerk. I don't know if anybody was there for it. Uh, it was a really important moment for us. And we were in New York, Berlin, London, uh, Mexico City, uh, Tokyo, Buenos Aires, Paris, Venice, in Venice, and we finished in Venice, Italy uh, two months ago uh, during the Biennale. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. We worked with uh, hundreds of artists and, and, and many platforms like FX Hash, like Artblocks, uh, and others along the way. Um, and it was a, um, a three-year party and a crisis, back, you know, up and down, up and down. Um, and we made it, and um, yeah, you know, proud of the story. It's, it's been, you know, it seems pretty um, obvious, but having in-person real life experiences to celebrate and experience digital art um, is very powerful because it, it creates an emotional attachment to the work that sometimes you, you just don't get on the screen. Yeah, I went to Kraftwerk every night when you were here. It was, it was really great meeting all the people and um, enjoyed every Bright Moments event I've been to. Um, Seifert, how about you? You were an artist, a founder of a platform. You were very successful for a full year, then you relaunched. Now you're successful again after the relaunch and the break you took. So how was it for you the past three years? Yeah, it's been a bit uh, crazy. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Baptiste Seifert. I was a generative artist, but uh, on the side, because there was super hard, you know, to, you have some computer program, how do you send it, how do you showcase it to others outside when it's meant to be seen on a computer? 
So I was on Shade or Toy or some other communities, like um, mainly posting stuff there um, and doing my own stuff on web browsers. And when I discovered about uh, art blocks, I was really, oh, well, this is actually uh, probably one of the most native way where how I would like my work to be uh, experienced by others and exist uh, in the world. And so I was like, yeah. Uh, well, I was going to say a bad word. Let's uh, let's get into that. I want to participate, and so um, I, I go to art blocks, and I'm like, oh, we have to uh, go through some um, process to uh, to post something. And I was very much of the you know open source, everything's open community. So I thought, hey, what's the other opportunity? Uh, sorry, what's the other option? There was none. So I, I thought about launching my own tool. Uh, first for uh, myself because I needed it and I thought okay maybe others will need it and so I launched FXH in such a way and yeah it's been uh, pretty crazy I wasn't expecting that many people to be interested in uh, this kind of tool I, I guess like everyone kind of wanted to release something uh, under Artblocks principles but there was no way for them to do so so sort of uh, opened the way for lots of artists to publish, and I was so amazed to see all of these projects. And I've always felt like it was hard for me to find a community of generative artists, because it's a bit of a niche, and I didn't quite know, you know, uh, any, anyone there. And so it was so great to connect with so many people that share the same passion. And throughout these like two, three years, well, there's been some up and downs, but it's been mostly super exciting to work with other artists and see them like use the tools that uh, we've built. And yeah, I think I quite enjoy uh, building tools for generative artists to have the ability to express themselves first, but also, well, uh, live a little bit better of their uh, passion because, you know, it's quite a struggle as an artist when you know no one to make your space out there. Uh, yeah, so, so far you've shared the success stories and uh, Seth, you said it was um, yeah, an up and down and watching your movie or your documentary was, uh, yeah, we could all see how emotional it was for you. And, you know, you plan basically from event to event and then since, I don't know, it's a two years by now, everyone is saying the market is bad. But I said from the very beginning, no, there was a hype and this is the reality. So no bad market. This is just what it is because before no one could buy well, really collected digital art. Now, then it happened. We had the hype, and now it's just like we're slowly building it up, right? So, how how was it for you to find us going through a hype and then like <laughs> down, and then having to build it up again? I mean, you're done with the ten events. You're preparing something. I think I'm not supposed um, to say so what you're doing. I'm a little bit older than Seifried. Um I'm 53, and um, I've been. To me, the, the, the hardest bubble to burst was Web1 uh, with the 1999-2000 with the internet bubble and I was an internet venture capitalist and I was 29, so it was my first cycle and it was brutal and I took it very, very personally. Um, it was all my fault. Um, and then in uh, you know, the next you know, Web2 cycle was 2008 and it wasn't as, as bad. I, I, kind of, I, saw, I saw the pattern and so whatever we just went through, um, and there's a good book uh, that Zach Small wrote called Token Supremacy um, that really charts from you know, the Beeple uh, sale, the $69 million sale, you know, through the, the depths of the bear market in 2022, um, up through Marfa art blocks late 22, but it sort of, it, it shows that bubble being burst. Um, I think I, um, you know, what was particularly intense for Bright Moments is we're a DAO and we are 100% uh, Ethereum. And we pay people and we pay artists in Ethereum. And when Ethereum goes from, you know, 4,000 at the end of 2021 to 1,000 in, you know, May or June of 2022, um, and then it goes back to 2,000, you know, it, it's, you, you feel the bumps um, particularly intensely um, but it, it creates a kind of, uh, I don't know what the German term is, like a grizzle, like grizzled entrepreneurs, that you're durable. And there were a lot of projects along the way um, that raised a lot of traditional money, you know, Web2 style, for equity, not for tokens. Um, and they are by the wayside. And they had too much money, and they had um, too much of a runway. 
and they plan too much, and then the market changes, and it's very hard to adapt. And I think to our credit and at times to our stress, we would, sp we would spend all the Ethereum we had every city, and we'd run out. And then it would force us to say, okay, oh, now we should probably work with AI artists because the market wants more AI artists, and now they want this, this kind of tokenomics, and they want an uh, English auction versus a Dutch auction. And so we kept having to adjust um, to really listen to where the market was and really align the, you know, the art with the collectors and, and to try to be uh, sustainable. So the road to success is watch what's happening. Don't plan with a too big team. Like Don't plan with two, three years ahead. Just watch what's happening. Don't take it personal and enjoy the ride. As much as like, you can. Like a roller coaster, it's fun to go down as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? <laughs> okay. Um, Seifert, how was it for you? You relaunched, you were on Tezos, on the Tezos blockchain, and uh, you relaunched on Ethereum in December 2023. Uh, yeah, when the market was already difficult. Crisis, yeah. yes or no? I mean, uh, when the when I started FX, like it only went downhill from there. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, I've never quite experienced the craziness of the market. I mean, in the early days, it was like it was much more active, but still, it wasn't near like the top of the activity. So yeah, I've only experienced going down so far. And you know, it's a, it's a pattern I've seen in my life personally. So I guess I'm used to deal with this and. As long as you know, we are enjoying ourselves, like building uh, fun experiences with artists. But I, I think I've sort of lost my energy a bit in the way because you know we're building um, big tools that weren't giving, getting some traction from artists because either it was too complex or when there is no market, also it's hard for them to invest time in in, sh in building this. So like at the beginning of the year, we we s we sit together around the table and we're like, okay what are we going to do? Because we were all very tired. Like we launched on Ethereum, it was lots of efforts. And uh, yeah, the, we didn't get the energy like back sort of. And so now we are more focused on building uh, funny experiences. Uh, we actually had this thought about, you know, adapting to the market. And we didn't quite, quite want to go there because the problem with this approach is that you sort of end up always ch chasing the last thing. and Sometimes it might not be interesting at all. Sometimes uh, also it's not sustainable. It may be, uh, like leave a mark and something you're going to have to support for the long term. That's not worth it at all. So we are more like, okay, now we're just going to build stuff that we like and that we really enjoy as artists, as uh, builders. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, well, it doesn't work, <laughs> whatever. But at least we'll have fun along the way. The same as Fellowship is a very good example. I mean, they started with photography, it went well, then they they tried AI, It they tried a few things, and then they found the recipe what people like on daily XYZ, they do daily auctions, there's always something happening, they do big releases, so yeah, sometimes you also just have to stick through the not so great times and do what you believe in. And then we have an artist with us, Yvonne Atau, AI artist, also a pioneer of this generation. And we just met in the hallway and you were like, I'm an artist, I don't even know what, I have to s what I'm supposed to say here. I guess you have to say a lot. And um, the interesting thing is you're part of a um, very novel idea of, um, yeah, um, NFTs are basically for trading. Um, let's put it that way short. Um, but you're part of a project where the releases are locked, so people can't trade. Um, how do you feel about that? And what are the responses from collectors when you take away that part, what everyone thinks NFTs are, are about trading and getting rich quick? Yeah, Congratulations to everyone who made it. Uh, yeah, so I just uh, as, a, as an intro, I will just say that, well, that's the thing that when you're an artist, you just have to live through all those bubbles. And I'm an AI artist. And a few years ago, when I was saying I'm an AI artist, everyone was like, oh, that's so interesting. What are you doing? You're training your own models. Wow. Now I'm in the part of the cycle where, where I say I'm an AI artist. And everyone's like, wait a moment, wait a moment. Like, I, I can explain. I'm not using my journey. And like, you have to justify yourself because we are at this kind of hype cycle. So it's the same thing with NFTs. 
and I was quite fortunate to be on the hype side of the NFT circle, and this essentially catapulted me to have a career as an artist, which even if the bubble is over, but it has consequences personally as an artist that I still have till this day. And uh, the project I did with Obvious, a uh, French uh, group of also AI artists who are quite controversial and they were the first ones to sell an AI artwork at an auction at Christie's. And uh, we were talking about this whole speculation bubble. So we are living in one bubble of AI and we are also living in the bubble of NFT speculation. There is this thing called flipping. Uh, that, of course, was mentioned before already, where the works would be sold, resold, and as an artist, we would be part of this commodification of artwork, and we would realize that, well, there's this gr huge group of collectors who would buy our work because they like it, the groups like La Random or Funny Guys who really appreciate this stuff from historical perspective, but there's also this huge group of collectors who are just buying as a speculation trying to guess that the artwork will go up and then quickly sell that. So we were approached by Verse and by Mimi to do a project with a distributed gallery which locks NFTs. And it was a perfect opportunity to talk about those bubbles and to lock NFTs against speculation. So what it essentially does is that NFTs can be minted at the creation, they can be created but similarly to how Jonas Lund has his contracts, the work we work with has a contract which is built into blockchain, so it's not possible to overcome. But this contract means that the NFTs can only be resolved at a certain point in the future. So there's no flipping. And as a collector, you buy that with the knowledge that, well, maybe you will not be able to resolve the work in a long time. And every work is locked in a different manner and it's tied to, of course, AI index. And AI index is the public sentiment around AI. And the public sentiment also shifts, goes up and down. We see those crazy headlines, AI is taking jobs, AI is amazing, AI is curing cancer. So there's a lot of speculation in society around AI again. After NFT, now everyone wants to talk about AI. And we wanted to see how the sentiment shifts in time. So every Every piece in the 100-piece collection is tied to a different value, different sentiment value. So it ranges from very dystopic to very utopic versions of the society at this point of time. So kind of a speculative future. And, uh, and yeah, the reception has been quite mixed, <laughs> as, as you asked, because I guess some of the collectors might want it to flip the work, so they, they don't like the point that, well, they might need to, to hold the work for, for longer time. So, um, but on the other side, the conceptual part of, of being part of something as interesting as lockable tokens for the future has also uh, attracted some interest and uh, I, I'm very proud to, to say that also a piece from, from this collection has been acquired by institutions and Takem, who we had a pleasure to listen to yesterday, also has one in the collection. So. Uh, this, this is controversial, this is interesting, but I guess when you're making art, uh, you're not always making art for the market, and it's interesting to just have the pieces who are more on the conceptual level and also talk about those, those bubbles and those hypes we experience. Yeah, and the generations before us, they didn't experience the market. Um, I think Frida is someone who really, yeah, it wants to keep, and it's important, I think, also to keep things separate sometimes. and. Basim, you were part of a conference in London. We met there for the first time in person. Cybernetic serendipity, I think it was towards AI. It was like basically a follow-up conference from um, 86. And it was really frustrating. Everyone seemed to be like really angry on stage and it was, was interesting. Was I angry? No, you were great. And it's not bad being angry. I mean, um, female rage, Taylor Swift. I hope I see some of you in Hamburg at the concert. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, I was somehow a, a bit surprised about the mood there. And um, yeah, the academics and intellectuals were like really not so happy about everything that happened. What's your perspective? You ex also experienced the conference. Yeah, I felt like um, in that event in particular, there was kind of a contortion going on between the kind of historical reach into the lineage of cybernetic and computational art and how it, we can contextualize the art, longer arc of media art uh, to the present. And so I felt that it's that kind of connective tissue that we're also gesturing at and probing at here 
Um, but that was a half day of discourse and then a half day of creative um, things. And so like in the fullness of time here, we've had much more um, space to explore the nuances and to, to probe at these, these connections through time, through space and through technology. Um, so I'll just say something about uh, some context as to why I might be here. Um, so I'm nominally a scholarly researcher primarily. Um, I do have some creative practice, mostly literary and sonic, but I'm very happy to not identify as an artist. Um, however, I do, I'm a member of a collective which is considered as a, like an art, art organization, perhaps even a para-institution that's called the Zero X Salon, that's based here in Berlin. And we're engaged in, as well as like a post-epistemic discourse series, we're also engaged in a residency program. And we create uh, various creative works in different media. They might be like um, interactive storytelling environments, they might be theatrical productions, card games, radio plays. And they're um, engaged in the business of critiquing technology from outside or like from the, the perimeter, let's say. So we're not putting our works on the chain, but we're thinking about the chain and what happens uh, from the chain. Um, so I suppose um, one thing to say is I wrote an article for the Web3 edition of the Spike Art magazine a few years ago, and I called that the revolution will not be tokenized. So I suppose I'm playing the role of the cartoonish villainous skeptic mm -hmm. in this room today. Um, but like I'm sure we all realize reality is more nuanced than uh, pictures in black and white, although pictures in black and white are also very nice. Um, and we all contain multitudes as these topics indeed do. And so the, um, the prompt of this, you know, this panel about, as to whether NFTs are in a crisis or there's still a success story, well, seeing as we're, in the, we're not far from the, uh, the, the grave of Hegel, I thought we might engage in a tiny spot of Hegelian synthesis here and look for the secret third thing, um, which is the gap between reality and expectations that you, Annika, gestured to earlier, when that gap seems to be smaller than ever. So I'm not such a market-oriented person. I'm not, that, um, I'm not following the rise and fall, the success and the failure of, of tokens and individual projects so much. I'm much more interested in the... Um, the imprint and the impression that the technologies and what they're possible, what's possible to be done with them leaves on uh, artistic communities, on collectors, and on other people in the ecosystem. And like blockchain um, and you know, token art, NFTs more specifically, will always occupy a space in this long arc of the history of media art as a new medium, like it's a de novo, you know, sui generis medium, and that makes possible new things that were never possible on any other creative or technical medium before. And for that, I think it's amazing. But um, I don't love all of what I see in the crypto art world. That's a nice summary. Um, I guess we all remember was that must have been two years ago, I think, an article in the in, uh, on Artnet forgot the name of the writer. I think I've never heard about her really before, but then she was suddenly very famous because she wrote NFTs are dead and the whole NFT space, like I've never seen people so angry, like really angry. And then I was like, I don't want to contribute at this point. And then I took me a while. I don't know why I was that slow because I have more of a traditional background. And the next day I was like, this article is genius, right? Because she says NFTs are dead, which is beautiful because how many times have we heard uh, painting is dead? So I was like, this is genius. Finally, digital art is dead, which means it's super alive because otherwise they wouldn't say it's dead, right? So that was for me actually after like 24 hours, after like was everyone was fighting, I was like, this is crazy. Um, I was like, this is the best news ever. Let's celebrate. Um, so what are your thoughts? What is dead may never die, I heard yeah, somebody exactly. say once. I found it like after that, I was like, yes, let's celebrate. Um, so yeah, what are your predictions for the future or your thoughts? I think we have two minutes left and Suzanne is very strict, so we're all scared. <laughs> Closing words, what are your predictions for the future? NFTs are still a thing, dead. What are you going so, to you do? Know, uh, uh, you know, Bright Moments is, is dead, but Bright Moments is also going to do something next May. 15th at Craftwork. Um, it's, a, it's kind of an opportunity to think about like what a digital documenta would be like, a kind of a new kind of digital art fair. It's a magnificent space. And so that's the plan. Um, and quick, in terms of a quick prediction, I think about a barbell. Oh, I'm in trouble. Barbell, like there's super scarce, valuable uh, uh, art pieces, crypto art pieces. At the same time, we have this proliferation of layer two, base, Solana. So I think the key is, you know, either side of the barbell, but kind of don't get mid-curved, as they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go there every night, over 
just one night? Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. You can go there every night. It's great. Going to be great. Yeah, I think for me the take home is to always uh, seek the medium specific affordances of the technologies that you're working for. Uh, look at what's what, what it's good for. One of the criticisms of blockchain in the past has been it's a problem looking for a solution. Well, I would posit that uh, the artistic application is one of the solutions and I appreciate that more than many of the others because it doesn't promise anything other than it delivers. There is no kind of magical happy ever after, there's just the art. Mm. Yeah, I think that uh, NFTs as a word is, is definitely dead. Uh, it's going through the period of rebranding, but the technology that is behind that, the tokenization, I mean, art institutions love to talk about tokenized digital artworks. And it essentially is the same technology behind the scenes and it will continue because we don't have any better alternative, at least since now. Yeah, I will say the same. Like. Uh, I will still be a generative artist tomorrow. Where will I publish my work? So as long as there isn't any alternative, this one makes sense. And uh, um, yeah, there is no way it's going out if there is still a need for people to use it. Thank you. And someone like Herbert W. Franke and all the pioneers are the best example to just continue what you love doing and what you believe in. It doesn't matter what other people think. We're here today and they were right. Let's hope we're also right. So let's keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you.